Hey everyone, and welcome to the radiology section of your Step 2 CK preparation. For those of you who have not had a chance to review the surgery section yet, my name is Matt Kinney, and I completed medical school at the University of Virginia, and am now an orthopedic surgery resident at UC San Diego. Over the next three lectures, we will discuss the high-yield radiographic subjects you will see on your exam, including the indications for each radiologic test, the normal appearance of anatomic structures, and some of the pathologic findings that you may expect to see on your exam. Before we begin, I want to note that you will be expected to know the indications for each of these imaging techniques, as well as the proper study to order if you suspect a certain disease. However, you will never be asked point blank to identify a structure or disease based solely on a radiographic image. Rather, the test makers include the images themselves to complement the question stem and assist you in coming to the proper diagnosis. Thus, while you must know what test to order when, additional familiarity with the common imaging findings can confirm the diagnosis suggested by the question stem and can save you a significant amount of precious time on your Step 2 CK exam. In this first lecture, we will review the various different types of x-rays you can expect to see at some point on your exam, and will then shift focus to the advanced imaging modalities in the next two sessions. Without a doubt, x-ray is by far the most commonly ordered imaging study, and this is reflected on the exam with the presence of lots of x-ray images accompanying the question stems. Knowledge and understanding of these images is guaranteed to help you correctly answer many questions on Step 2 CK. Let's start by discussing chest x-rays. Perhaps the most important consideration in the field of radiology is actually understanding what tests to order. For chest x-rays, there are a myriad of signs and symptoms that should trigger you to order this exam, starting with a cough of unknown origin. While cough can commonly be caused by postnasal drip or gastroesophageal reflux disease, if they don't give you any diagnostic clues about a patient with a cough, a chest x-ray is always warranted. The very first step in the management of shortness of breath or dyspnea should always be providing supplemental oxygen, but an urgent chest x-ray is also recommended to narrow the differential of conditions that cause this dyspnea. Pleuritic type chest pain is pain with deep inspiration which occurs due to irritation of the pleural lining of the lungs. While a squeezing type chest pain initially requires evaluation with EKG, chest x-ray is the test of choice for pleuritic pain. Finally, hemoptysis can result from cancer or other lung lesions, and these patients must initially be imaged with x-rays as well. Along with the subjective complaints just discussed, there are several exam findings you may see on the test which also warrant a chest x-ray if you are asked about the next step in management. Crackles, or RALs, indicate fluid in the lungs, often secondary to pulmonary edema, and ronchi are indicative of bronchial airway obstruction, sometimes secondary to COPD. These diagnoses can both be made from chest x-ray. On step two, wheezing is often associated with asthma, which cannot be diagnosed via chest x-ray, but can also be indicative of an underlying tumor. Hyperresonance or dullness to percussion can be secondary to a pneumo or hemothorax. Chest wall tenderness may be a result of a rib fracture. Tracheal deviation is strongly associated with tension pneumothorax, an emerging condition that must be quickly diagnosed via x-ray and treated. Finally, superior vena cava syndrome occurs as a result of compression of the superior vena cava by a tumor or mass lesion leading to the backing up of blood flow into the neck veins and head, causing jugular venous distension and plethora, respectively. The chest x-ray shown to the right displays a large tumor in the right thoracic cavity that is compressing the superior vena cava, leading to the symptoms of SVC syndrome. If you are asked about the next step in the management of a patient presenting with any of these conditions, you should immediately order a chest x-ray, which can provide key diagnostic clues. Let's start evaluating chest x-rays by looking at some normal examples. Seen here is a normal posterior to anterior chest film. This is the standard chest x-ray positioning and it helps to minimize the ionizing radiation dose absorbed by the tissues that are most sensitive to radiation, specifically breast and thyroid tissue, by shooting the x-ray beam from the back and having the cassette positioned anteriorly. 
This view provides the best visualization of the lung fields, heart borders, and the diaphragm. Unfortunately, it requires a patient to be mobile because the source of the x-ray beam must be placed behind the patient. Thus, it is a poor option for bedridden patients. Seen here is an anterior to posterior chest x-ray. While PA films are preferred for several reasons, AP films are often more convenient to obtain because in a bedridden patient, the cassette can just be slid underneath the patient and the x-ray source placed above the bed. Thus, AP films are often utilized in an ICU setting as well as in paralyzed patients. Unfortunately, these images are often of inferior quality because they are taken by portable x-ray machines. Lateral x-rays, like the one seen here, are extremely useful in corroborating the findings seen on an AP or PA film. Having an orthogonal view allows for better determination of the front-to-back position of a lesion within the thoracic cavity, which can be very important in differentiating certain conditions, such as hilar lymphadenopathy secondary to sarcoidosis from a mass lesion within the lung tissue itself. Furthermore, since the thoracic cavity dives most inferior in its posterior aspect, as can be appreciated here, lateral films are much more sensitive for diagnosing pleural effusions and can detect less than 100 milliliters of fluid in the pleural cavity, whereas standard PA films have difficulty detecting anything less than 200 to 300 milliliters. The final x-ray position we will discuss is the lateral decubitus view which is taken with the patient lying on one side. While not a standard x-ray view, lateral decubitus films are useful when a pleural effusion cannot be differentiated from a region of consolidation like a lower lobe pneumonia. When the patient lies on their side for a lateral decubitus film, if the finding on the PA x-ray is fluid, it will layer out because fluid in the pleural space is freely mobile. However, if the finding is a consolidation within the lung parenchyma, it will not change location, but rather will remain localized to the lower lobe of the lung. Having now discussed indications for chest x-ray and the normal appearance of the different x-ray views you may be shown on your exam, let's now move on and evaluate some pathologic chest x-rays. One of the classic indications for chest x-ray is evaluation of pneumonia and this film shows the appearance of a pneumonia, specifically in the left lower lobe. As depicted by the red circle, a lobar pneumonia appears as a localized, partially radio-opaque consolidation that corresponds to the anatomy of a lung lobe. If you are presented with a patient with symptoms of cough, fever, and this image, you should assume pneumonia and select the most appropriate antibiotic treatment. In contrast to a pneumonia, Solitary pulmonary nodules are generally very well circumscribed with identifiable borders, as seen in this lesion in the left lower lobe of the lung. They often have regions of calcification, which appear bright white on x-ray, but can be uniform as well. Solitary pulmonary nodules are often incidental findings found on chest x-rays that are initially obtained for another reason, and can represent a variety of conditions, including granulomas, abscesses, and benign or malignant tumors. You should use the other information provided in the question stem to guide your management of a solitary pulmonary nodule. The image on the left shows a drastic example of a pleural effusion, which results from fluid accumulation in the space between the visceral and parietal pleura of the lung. This condition is most often associated with left heart failure, but can result from many other etiologies as well. The classic finding of a pleural effusion on x-ray is a radio-opaque area in the dependent region of the lung. White out of the costophrenic angle, the area pointed to with the arrow on the left image, is the initial finding of pleural effusion on an AP film since it is the most dependent area of the lung. And as the fluid volume in the pleural space increases, the amount of lung that is whited out will also increase. The image on the right is a lateral decubitus film and as discussed previously, this view can confirm a pleural effusion by showing that the fluid in the lungs changes position when the patient lies on their side. Note the fluid level depicted by line A. If this were a pneumonia or some other disease of the lung tissue itself, the area of opacity would not layer out in this fashion. 
Another classic condition that can be diagnosed via chest x-ray is a pneumothorax, or a so-called collapsed lung. Note the white line that is depicted by the arrows on this chest x-ray. This is actually the border of the left lung, which is usually found all the way out at the edge of the thoracic cavity. Due to trauma or a ruptured bleb, the vacuum between the visceral and parietal pleura of the lungs has been disrupted, which causes the lungs to collapse inward. You may also observe that there is a loss of lung markings lateral to the area of lung collapse, because this area that used to be filled by lung tissue and blood vessels is now solely filled with air. This patient will require a chest tube to suction out this air-filled cavity and reinflate the lung. One final high-yield pathologic finding that you may see on a chest x-ray on your Step 2 CK exam is actually not a lung finding at all, but rather an abdominal finding that of free air under the diaphragm. The only place that air should be found in a normal abdomen is within the bowel. So if air is present outside of the bowel, it means that the bowel has perforated and released air into the peritoneal cavity. This can best be appreciated by seeing the appearance of an air bubble under the right hemidiaphragm as is depicted by the arrow. Remember that an air bubble under the left hemidiaphragm is expected because that's where the stomach lives. A chest x-ray is actually better to detect free air in the diaphragm than an abdominal x-ray, because abdominal films don't always image the entire diaphragm, and thus free air may be missed. If you see this image on your test, especially in a patient with peritoneal signs like guarding and rebound tenderness, you should suspect a bowel perforation and prepare the patient for an exploratory laparotomy. While chest x-rays are perhaps the single most important imaging modality, and thus the one you are most likely to see on your exam. The indications for an abdominal x-ray are actually very narrow. On your Step 2 CK exam, the only reason you should order an abdominal x-ray is to evaluate for a small bowel obstruction in a patient who presents with nausea and vomiting and is found on exam to have a distended abdomen and diffuse abdominal pain. Note that there are other specific indications for abdominal pain films, but they are beyond the scope of your Step 2 CK exam. Along with making the broad diagnosis of small bowel obstruction, abdominal x-rays can also help distinguish between a mechanical obstruction in which the bowel lumen is physically obstructed due to twisting on an adhesion or strangulation within a hernia sac, and an ileus in which the intestine lumen is patent but the bowel wall is not peristalsing, which can occur after surgery or secondary to opioid use. There are two standard abdominal x-ray views that you should be familiar with, the first of which is seen here. This is an upright abdominal plane film, which gives visualization of the abdomen and the top of the pelvis. Note the multiple areas of lucency within the abdominal cavity. This is air within the bowel, a normal finding. You may also be able to visualize stool in a constipated patient, but constipation is better diagnosed via patient history and physical exam. The second type of abdominal x-ray is called a KUB film, which stands for kidneys, ureters, and bladder. A KUB is just a supine view of the abdomen, which can be useful for detecting dilated loops of bowel caused by a small bowel obstruction. The image seen here is a normal KUB film. On the upright abdominal plane film seen on this slide, you can see the classic radiographic findings of a small bowel obstruction. First. Note how wide the air-filled bowel is. When air, fluid, and stool cannot pass through the bowel, either due to a mechanical obstruction or an ileus, the resulting increase in intraluminal pressure causes distension of the bowel wall, so the bowel diameter increases, as can be seen on this image. Furthermore, this image also shows another classic finding of a small bowel obstruction, which is the presence of air fluid levels. Air fluid levels can only be seen on upright films, not on supine KUB films, and occur because gravity will naturally pull fluid trapped in an obstructed bowel to the lowest point, leaving the remainder of the bowel lumen filled with air. The type of air fluid level is also important. Here, you see a stair-step pattern of air fluid levels, which means that the bowel is peristalsing but cannot move the contents of the bowel due to a mechanical obstruction. If the cause of the obstruction were a functional ileus in which the bowel is no longer peristalsing, you would still have air fluid levels, 
but they would all be found at the same level, and you would not see stair stepping. The final types of patients that require x-ray imaging are patients with orthopedic injuries. If you are suspicious of a fracture based on the symptoms of pain, swelling, and the presence of a bony deformity after a traumatic injury, x-ray is always the test of choice. Furthermore, bone tumors should initially be evaluated with x-ray, so if a patient complains of chronic bony pain that is worse at night, x-ray the bone in question. The image to the right shows a hand x-ray that reveals a giant cell bone tumor of the fourth metacarpal. Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone, and classic x-ray findings can help make the diagnosis, as we will discuss on the next slide. Finally, in an emergency room setting, you must be prepared to order a skeletal survey, which is basically a series of x-rays that evaluate all the bones in the body. There are two classic patients that you may encounter on your Step 2 CK exam that require a skeletal survey. The first is a patient who comes in after a serious traumatic event, like a motor vehicle collision. Trauma patients often present with altered mental status and thus are unable to tell you what has been injured, or they may have one big painful injury that is distracting them from noticing pain associated with smaller fractures. Also, if you have a child come in with an injury that doesn't make logical sense based on the story that the parents tell you, or if you suspect child abuse for any reason at all, a skeletal survey is necessary to evaluate for old fractures that may reveal a pattern of abuse and confirm the tragic diagnosis of child abuse. As mentioned on the previous slide, osteomyelitis is an infection that occurs within the bone itself and can be a very serious condition because it is a tough infection to clear. If you are given a question stem with a patient complaining of bone pain, local swelling, and symptoms of systemic infection such as fever, your index of suspicion should be high for osteomyelitis, and you should order an x-ray. There are two classic findings for osteomyelitis on x-ray, and if you see them on the exam, it should confirm your diagnosis. The first is periosteal elevation, which on x-ray appears like a cloudy area adjacent to bone, as depicted by the red arrow on the image to the right. The second sign is osteolysis, which is an area of increased lucency within the bone. A classic example is circled in red. If the bone infection is chronic, the darker area of lytic bone will be surrounded by a bright white rim, which is called sclerosis. While you would never be expected to diagnose osteomyelitis on an MRI, it should be noted that x-ray changes are delayed about two weeks after the onset of osteomyelitis, and an MRI can pick it up a little earlier. This is a nitpicky point, but one that theoretically could be tested. All right, everyone, that's it for x-rays. In our next lecture, we will discuss CTs and talk about when you should order them, as well as the classic CT findings you should be familiar with to help you answer questions on exam day.